Welcome to today's webinar, What Does Equity and Smart Growth Really Mean? A conversation between Calvin Gladney and Andre Perry, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, which is supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and is managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that provides current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. Today's program is the fourth offering of Planning with Purpose, a Smart Growth Network webinar series on community revitalization. In this series, the Smart Growth Network is sharing new ideas and approaches taken from current planning issues and case studies that have made us aware of the need to broaden our smart growth lens. We want to share with and learn from you with the hope that together we can create communities of the future that are healthy, equitable, and resilient for everyone. We are recording this webinar and will post it on our website early next week on the, under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to get smart growth news and information and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also learn about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Deplan Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible, eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP, AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account and search for the name of today's event, which is, what does equity and smart growth really mean? A conversation between Calvin Gladney and Andre Perry. You can also search for event number 920-7464. So to get started, our guests today are Calvin Gladney and Andre Perry. Calvin Gladney is the president and CEO of Smart Growth America and has led community revitalization efforts in dozens of communities around the country as a private consultant, a real estate developer, and as a government official. His work over the last 15 years has been centered on the intersection of land use, transportation, and economic development. Prior to working at Smart Growth America, he was managing partner of Mosaic Urban, a real estate advisory service and development firm. In 2017, Mr. Gladney was the Urban Land Institute's Senior Visiting Fellow for Equity. Before establishing Mosaic, he served as Vice President of the Anacostia Waterfront Corporation, or the AWC, a quasi-public agency in Washington, D.C., focused on environmentally friendly development. He graduated cum laude from the Harvard Law School, received his BS from Cornell University, and is lead accredited professional. He is a trustee of the Urban Land Institute and a board member for the Center for Community Progress. He is also a member of ULI's National Responsible Property Investment Council. In his spare time, Calvin, well, Calvin doesn't have any spare time, but he will make time for you. You can connect with him on Twitter, on, and on Instagram at, at SmartGrowthCEO. Andre Perry is a fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution, a scholar in residence at American University and a columnist for the Heckinger Report. He is the author of the new book, Know Your Place, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. A nationally known and respected commentator on race, structural inequality, and education, Perry is a regular contributor to MSNBC and has been published by the New York Times, The Nation, The Washington Post, TheRoot.com, and CNN.com, among many other media outlets. His research focuses on race and structural inequity, 
uh, Education and Economic Inclusion. Perry's recent scholarship at Brookings has analyzed black majority cities and institutions in America, focusing on valuable assets worthy of increased investment. A native of Pittsburgh, Dr. Perry earned his PhD in education policy and leadership from the University of Maryland College Park. Following their discussion, Calvin and Andre will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime during their discussion by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Calvin, who's going to uh, lead the conversation today. This is not the usual kind of uh, webinar uh, presentation we do. It's a more of a discussion, and Calvin will lead that with Andre. So welcome, both of you. Andre, how you doing, man? Oh, it's always a struggle out here for a black man in America, but I'm surviving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not no. going to take the bait on that one, man. I'm not going to take the bait. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, it's a juggle and a struggle. It's a juggle yeah. and a struggle. Well, I see uh, your book is well placed behind you, so hopefully we'll be able to let you let everybody know about the book, um, all of your great work, and and use that as many jumping off points to uh, this conversation. So. Um, well, I'm going to have you be more of the leader of the conversation and I can be more responsive because I know that you do that so well. I've seen you do it multiple times now. So while well, I hand the, the virtual baton to you and, you know, we could talk about Pittsburgh, we could talk about Brooklyn, we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. But I think racial equity and smart growth is probably where we should go. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll start by just saying when I first read or heard the term smart growth. It actually was um, in, during grad school in the late 90s, I believe. And I was doing a research project that examined um, the cost, the transportation costs of busing in, in certain states. Now, right. at the time, it was increasing rapidly. Um, and then, obviously, I, I, I did some research and it was connected to urban sprawl. Um, the growth of cities was literally growing in size and, and distance. And that was causing many school districts to have to um, bus students for longer distances, requiring more gas, more time. And that's when I learned that there were activists, um, loosely affiliated activists, of different types who were trying to make a more sustainable community. Um, so sprawl was sort of the, um, the, the, the principal center of this issue around smart growth. It's, the evil, to, it's the evil villain in our origin story. <laughs> exactly. And then I learned that you, know, you had sort of environmentalists working on this issue. You had people who were Inter interested in transit-oriented development in this it, on this issue. You had those who were just interested in economic development, and th they were fairly disparate organizations all working on the um, how to curb sprawl. No pun intended there. Um, but the and then you also had around the same time Al Gore. Um, the um, American Association, uh, American Planning Association, HUD, and a lot of other actors, various foundations started to get in, involved. And this, this term smart growth really started to emerge. Now, it primarily stayed in elite circles for the most part, policy circles. Um, but um, I first learned about this issue really uh, um, uh, with looking at superintendents and they're scratching their head asking, <laughs> why are my transportation costs going up every year? And in some cases they had fewer students and the, and the costs kept going up. And obviously it was, um, they were using more um, transportation services. And what were the demographics of those kids on those buses? Well, no, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because there's primarily white kids that we're talking about. Well, we were often talking about suburban um, folks being transported for the most part um, in, in, in the studies I examined. 
Um, and, you know, I have to say that many of these dynamics were caused by um, some of the urban development plans of the past. Um, we know that um, the highway systems that barreled through black communities eventually helped facilitate the growth of suburbs. And, right. Um, right. And, and we kind of, we'll get into that a little bit later around racial equity, but, and, and what smart growth should also include. But when I, when I did these studies, it was really um, the consequence of building outward um, the constant building outward. And oftentimes that came at the detriment of black people. So when we're talking about smart growth, we should not forget much of the source of the problems that we see were actually stem from the devaluation of black communities and the, the, the um, inability for folks to want to live close to black people. And so mm -hmm. um, we should never forget that story because oftentimes we talk about traffic, we talk about environmentalism, we talk about economic development, and we forget about Black people. And that you know, part it, it, it's interesting you said that. And, and one of the things that I think, frankly, will be an evolution, both in terms of the smart growth movement and how we talk about things, is to really in a sense, take a step back and be clear about the history and be more affirmative in saying that mistakes were made, there were blind spots, there were missed opportunities. And frankly, a lot of the tools of smart growth have unfortunately been used as tools of racism, as tools of white supremacy, as tools of, as you said, anti-blackness. And you can take this all the way back to the Homestead Act, where land use, folks were given land. It was really a sort of a push west and a push. It was in some ways a sprawl on a nationwide basis. Right. But black people and other, um, you know, black and brown people, but particularly and specifically black people, but other ethnic groups as well, were explicitly excluded from getting those plots of land. Um, that was sort of race-based land use at the very beginning. You can look at whether you read Richard Rothstein's Color of Law, or you just know about redlining and the original intent of most of our zoning. Most of the intent of our original zoning was to create land uses where certain people could live or not live. So you had racial covenants. I, I used to live in Oakland, California, and bought a house and had to sign a deed that had the racial covenant still in it. And then they add a sort of addendum on top of it saying this no longer applies. But whether it's land use, like you said, whether it's transportation infrastructure and our building out of mo different options of mobility, whether you, you think about the 50s and the transportation system, um, or even some of our economic development choices, we could go back to the GI Bill and say, we gave folks a leverage point to get education as a way of economic development and explicitly excluded lots of folks and in particular by design black folks. So one of the things I like to talk about is, you know, we have a lot of great things that the smart growth movement has done, but there's been a lot of ways that the core tools of our movement have been used by design for negative um, reasons. And so one of the things we have to do now is say, not only do we know what the right tools are, there might be some additional tools we need to bring to the table. And some of the tools that we usually use may need to be thought about as tools of undoing injustice and not just tools for equity. Absolutely. Let me, and let's be clear, uh, I talk a lot about placemaking and planning and all of these issues. And um, unfortunately, many of the solutions that, as you mentioned, that have been brought to bear uh, from this movement um, has also injured um, black people. I always like with, with placemaking, I've always felt uncomfortable with that, that term. And like I state in my book, I'd say, you know, you don't make place, they already exist, you know, except for we make them for um, white people often. Um, and we displace black people in the process. And so um, until we center black people 
in smart growth. It's not really smart it, because part of this movement is around sustainability. And if we're not sustaining the populations that have been injured by our past policies, then what the heck are we doing? And so we should not kid ourselves that people, because and you know this more than anybody, when we talk planning, we often talk about brick and mortar. We also often talk about streets, pipes, um, all these different things. We don't talk necessarily talk about people. There's an assumption that it will benefit people, but we don't ex um, explicate people and people who have been injured by past policy. So I've been arguing, and I think you are a leader in this area, that we have got to recognize black lives, brown lives, in, in our strategies to improve our communities. Because if, if black people are not present, then the whole sustainable sustainability argument this falls apart. Right. And, you know, I mean, one of the sort of push pulls here is that a lot of the things we've done as a movement, transit oriented development, making sure that we create more mixed use places, mixed income places, um, that we think about place and think about mobility at the same time as we think about the buildings. A lot of those have had some upsides and benefit, benefits to black and brown people. The challenge is that for all the benefits that have accrued, in some cases that all boats rise theory doesn't really work because in some cases people are not on a boat so <laughs> they right. couldn't arise when all the boats are rising um, and in some cases again unfortunately some of those same tools that are great tools that are the right tools were used in an exclusionary way or frankly in these days it's less about exclusion on purpose but by default lack of inclusion and right. so one of the things that I think we're gonna do and we continue to do, and a lot of the folks who believe in the principles and tactics will do along with us, is to say, how do we make sure we're being inclusive? So for example, and that it, it relates to race and it relates to other you know, challenges as well. So if you're a person um, of differing abilities, if you have a disability, you might say, well, that's great. You're talking about complete streets and you're creating these bike lanes, but are those bike lanes wide enough for folks that have different types of bikes that might not be the normal type of bike because of disabilities. So you, you can think about all of the categories, but particularly when it comes to race, we have to say to ourselves, are all the strategies that we use that are the right ones, and this comes up during COVID and the pandemic now, let's make sure that the use of that strategy is inclusive the use of that strategy doesn't exacerbate an existing disparity um, or double down on injustices of the past. Um, and frankly, too, takes into account some different perspectives, which is why we're trying to broaden the table of folks who work on smart growth. Real example, I'll give you a real story that um, I like to tell in DC. So one day I'm in an Uber um, and the Uber, and you can tell this is pre-pandemic because we're not doing a lot of Ubers these days. Shout out to my friends at Uber, by the way. Uh, that wasn't an Uber disc, but I'm in a I'm in an Uber, um, and there's a black guy driving um, in D.C. and he's driving me home to my neighborhood in, in D.C. And you know we're driving. I'm sitting in the back. I'm on my phone, and suddenly a guy rolls by in a bike lane, and it's a a black guy who appears to be in his 30s, early 40s, and he's on a bike. And the black guy looks at me through the rear view mirror and says, black guy on a bike at night? Oh, gotta be up to no good. <laughs> and it's just, it's reminiscent of there are things that we know are the right answer. And sometimes we, 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 we go to a community meeting, we're doing engagement and we're like, why are these people fighting against this thing that is totally the right answer? And sometimes it's because maybe we have a blind spot to their lived experience. Right. And so you might have a lived experience which says, as a black man, I'm not getting on a bike at night. So you can do all the complete streets you want, but I'm actually never gonna use it because it's not gonna be a safe space to me for a variety of non-related to smart growth reasons. Or 
hey, where are you bringing those bike lanes first? Is the bike lane the canary in the coal mine? Because every time I've seen mobility infrastructure come to my community, it is usually followed by displacement and other challenges. That doesn't mean that the smart growth tool is a tool for displacement, but sometimes it's a matter of putting yourself in the shoes of a different lived experience. And frankly, having more people with that lived experience at the table. So when we start thinking about our principles, our tactics, and the things that we can do and should do, we say, let's just make sure that if someone had a different lived experience, this would also be beneficial to them. Or do we have to do some more explaining on why this should make sense? But I, you know, I'll challenge you a little bit that I do think that many of the tools that we use, if done in the, in the um, improper order, they can displace and sometimes intentionally. I mean, we, we know that there is nothing inherently wrong with bike lanes, nothing. I mean, I, we should have bike lanes. We should encourage people riding bikes. We should encourage people walking. That is the right thing to do. However, if you don't have, if you're not um, meeting the needs of community first, if you're not doing the questionnaires, if you're not serving them, then who are you actually creating the bike lanes for? And we get we got to ask ourselves these questions, really. And that's why I play with this placemaking um, verbal waffle a bit, because who are we making a place for? Right. And if we are honest, we are often saying, we know what's best for you, community. You mm -hmm. need and again, there's nothing wrong with bike lanes. I, I appreciate a good bike lane, especially in, in the cities I've lived in. Um, they are phenomenal. But when you have people who've been asking for um, other things for decades and not getting it, when they see a bike lane, they're like, what just happened here? Right. And um, right. so for me, um, this is about figuring out how to make place for everyone. And I'll give you another example, another tool that was used inappropriately, in my opinion. I lived in New Orleans after hurricane, um, during Hurricane Katrina, after Hurricane mm -hmm. Katrina. And again, no one would argue that we did not need mixed income housing. Um, and I'm a big proponent of integration, if you follow me you know I'm a big proponent of integration, both socioeconomic integration and racial integration. I think both are vital um, to social growth. But um, after Hurricane Katrina, they, the city council voted to literally lock out all the, um, the housing projects in the city, lock them, even the ones that did not flood. And mm -hmm. they eventually knew that they were gonna build mixed income housing but they didn't put up the same number of units as the um, at the that the housing project um, afforded, and so you essentially displaced thousands of black, poor, low-income residents, the folks who actually needed the housing more so right. than anyone else. Um, you displaced them. Now again, well, I wouldn't no, call that smart. Those are that was not a that, smart growth. That was not a now. smart. That wasn't smart, but that's why I wanted to make a distinction between like a tool. Um, a lot of the tools that we use, and I'm glad you said that, those are not smart. That's not the smart application of the tool. So again, we've always got to be mindful that when we are implementing these um, um, smart growth strategies, that we are truly connected to members of the community that need the, 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 the growth. Right. Right. So but, well, and I, know, I, and I, I will say this, this is another issue and, and um, mm -hmm. for me, part of this is um, planners not being from or of the community. And it's also a, um, a reflection of the state of racial diversity in planning in, in itself. I mean, there is no question, you know, I think it's 2% of, of architects are um, black. I, I'm, I'm forgetting the, this the percentage of planners in general, but you don't forget the community when you have people represented in the community. Like, and so for me, it's also um, 
and when we're talking about inclusion, we have to look at the professionals, that there right. needs to be an effort to include more diversity in the profession. Right. And, you know, it, it almost comes down to, well, who's part of the movement? Um, yeah. And I think of this in a number of ways. One is we definitely need to get more folks with a variety of lived experiences at the table as one of the people talking about and trying to implement smart growth tools. So that's who works at SGA, who's on the board, who's at other smart growth organizations, all of those things. It also is who are we collaborating with? Because there are cases where the lived experience and subject matter ex expertise that relates to better racially equitable outcomes, more economic inclusion in the outcomes from various tactics really requires an expertise that as smart growthers, if you want to use that term, we shouldn't have. And so right. part of what we we often try to talk about more is to say that smart growth is this kind of interconnected, interdisciplinary mindset. But it, it also um, understands that it doesn't solve all the problems. And even though it is a set of tools, it's still just one tool in the larger ecosystem of tools for community revitalization, resilience, and sustainability. And so we have to be more clear that when we're in an environment and we're trying to use our various tools and ideas to do something to the benefit of the community, that it's not oversold of all the things we can solve. Right. Um, so that it isn't like, well, you know, for example, like a TOD project that is designed to solve some problems, but it can't solve all the problems. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to get away from some of the project level stuff and say, what we're focused on and what smart growth is focused on and what SGA is focused on is systems level change. Yeah. How do we change the proverbial and actual infrastructure to how we get to outcomes? So for example, we're making a push um, on changing land use and zoning so that land use and zoning is a positive tool for racial equity and is a positive tool for economic inclusion. That has never been the case historically, it's been the opposite. And right now, in some places it's neutral and in almost all cases, it's very hard to see how the zoning is promoting equity is supporting and pushing for economic in inclusion. So we're saying, hey, we know that smart growth doesn't solve all problems, but the things we're fighting on are at a systems level so that we can change that. If we can change how land use and zoning um, supports the ability to build more housing, um, supports the ability to have small businesses actually do some of the things that we're doing as an innovation during COVID, like have seats on the sidewalk. Like a lot of that was code and zoning that wouldn't allow for that. That's and right. so if we can make systems level changes that whether it's on economic development, whether it's on transportation, whether it's on land use, that's where our fight is both as an organization and as a movement. And if we can center racial equity in those system levels changes that we're fighting for through advocacy, through our technical assistance, through our thought leadership, through conversations like this, through reports that we're putting out, we can put all those together and affect the system, then that's when we're successful. You know, what I'm so, I actually am excited about smart growth in this regard, that um, because if you want to call it a movement of sort of loosely coupled um, affiliations, so you have like transit people, you have housing people, you have um, um, uh, um, other infrastructure people, you have various groups. You know, what this racial uprising is doing, you're starting to see um, black, brown, um, Asian folks forming new groups and, um, and, and being included in these existing movements. Yeah. And, I, and I think what will happen is when you see more black and brown people in the smart growth movement, there will be a greater emphasis on structural inequality because that's been sort of the the area that the Achilles heel, so to speak, of the smart growth movement, that they've been working within the confines of structural inequality. 
and sometimes the, the tools have reified what already existed. And so for me, it's like there's an opportunity to really advance the movement by in, being more inclusive and connected with yep. those affiliated. Um, um, no, um, it's it's so true, and it's interesting. Uh, if you go back, if you could go back in time, sort of back back to the future, um, to our website in 2008 and someone had sent a screenshot around a couple of months ago. In 2008, our website said that one of the key components of smart growth was social equity. Yeah. <laughs> that was 12 years ago. And there was a social equity conversation in our kind of origin story, along with the environmentalism and other things. So part of it is just reclaiming, reaffirming, and being more affirmative about a focus and a centering of equity, and I would say more specifically racial equity, because it's a dominant challenge that has domino effects on almost everything. And so I think that's part of the challenge. The second thing I'll say is, you know, if you go to Transportation Choices, an organization in Seattle, Washington, if you go to the Committee on Planning Excellence in Baton Rouge, if you go to East Metro Strong, which is located in St. Paul, Minnesota, or you go to New Jersey Future. All of those are smart growth organizations. None of them have the term smart growth in their name. So what we have to do is think about ourselves as a movement to say, it's not, in some ways, it's, not, it's a smart growth movement, small s, small g, because it's a Venn diagram of disciplines, of a mindset, and a set of shared outcomes that we're all trying to get to, healthier people, more resilient places and shared prosperity, this kind of economic inclusion, which is the language of the day, we all are trying to get to those outcomes and we're all using different tools that fit within the larger rubric of smart growth to do that. And so what we're trying to do and what we wanna do in the ecosystem is to say, this movement, it has a shared vocabulary, shared priorities, but we do need to either reclaim folks that used to be a part of the movement but have not recently, bring in more folks under the tent that have different subject matter expertise and lived experience, particularly when it comes to communities of color, black and brown people, and have a understanding of how even some of these technical tools might need to be tweaked or amended or changed to make sure that when you implement them, one of the core outcomes that you seek from the implementation is racial equity. So we, we have always been in the table, table building business. That's what SGA was founded essentially as a coalition to start. And so what we're doing now is to say this movement has a broad tent based on shared priorities, shared goals, not whether you call yourself a smart growler or you have smart growth in your name, but if you believe that racial equity has to be a goal of everything you do, if you believe that economic inclusion if done correctly, is one of the solution sets to many of the health, wealth, and mental disparities that you see across many communities. If you believe those things, let's all join together in this movement. The table is big enough for all of us, and we can all move forward. Now, um, I'm going to give a little plug for myself right now, since we're talking uh, hey. potential possibilities and solutions. I'm actually, uh, many of you know who follow my work or, um, or have read Know Your Price know that I do a lot of work on housing prices. Um, just to be brief, that I, I looked at home prices in black neighborhoods, com um, compared them to uh, home prices in white neighborhoods and controlled for education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics. We found that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23% about 48,000 per home with uh, which accumulatively there's a, a, lo a national loss of equity amounting to $156 billion, which is a, a large amount, would have financed more than 4 million black owned businesses based on the average amount blacks used to start their firms, would have um, um, financed more than 8 million four year degrees, it's a big number. But um, it's a problem you can't easily solve. You can't easily wave a magic wand at home prices and, and raise them because you will lock might people. have some negative effects if you do it that's, immediately. Yeah. That's right. So what I'm doing right now with Ashoka 
um, we're going to have a million dollar challenge competition. We're asking for um, people, and I know a lot of planners are out there, we're looking for market-based and policy-based solutions that will solve for, for housing devaluation. And you mentioned one of the key terms here, um, zoning. You know, we need interesting zoning policy moving forward to solve this issue. Um, zoning that will allow for um, more density, more affordability, um, different types of ownership models. Um, yep. And that's going to uh, take a, you know, it's going to require smart tools. So I just wanted to put that out there that there are, there's going to be opportunities for us to work together to solve some of these major problems that are that's robbing black, brown, and other underserved communities from um, a chance at the American dream. And for me, that's what smart growth is about, giving people opportunity, not not in not just providing um, bike lanes or um, but more broadly providing people opportunity. So I just want to put that out there. We're going to announce that prob probably later this month. So um, follow me on Twitter and you'll you'll <laughs> definitely hear the announcement. No shame in the game. No, no shame, shame. In the game. I love it. But you know it's it's critically important because you could say that there is a there is a negative racial dividend that accrues to certain folks, and that plays out in land use, transportation, and economic development policy writ large in the country. That's right. So that's one of the reasons why we, we've evolved to not only be advocates, as one might say it in the traditional sense, but also doing a lot of technical research and analysis. You know, we partner with Brookings and others in this regard, um, GW, lots of different groups, because we know that in some cases, it's not the advocacy for the right answer. It's like, do you actually have the data, the methodology, and the, and the, the, the basis for what you're fighting for? Um, right. And sometimes when people sort of don't see why and how we got here, sometimes you need the data, you know, like, I could imagine that you have talked to a black person about your book and they're like, you know, I don't even need to read your book. Everything you just said, I don't even understand your methodology and all that stuff you talked about and Zillow and blah, blah, blah. We've known that for 20 years. That's that exactly. our house somehow ends up being valued for less when I sold it and moved to a different, they already know that. But I think one thing that we've learned is that data and then real life people bringing their examples to the table are the way to do it. And so we see the movement and coalitions we're trying to build also say, maybe we need to do a Hill visit where the congressperson can talk to somebody from New Orleans who can talk about how this actually happened to them. So when we're thinking about getting a congressperson, a mayor, a city council member, presidential administrator to, change a systems level policy, we can bring to bear the data and the technical analysis, as well as the lived experience and the real stories. And that storytelling requires a, a broader table because you need other people to tell the stories. Sometimes it's not going to be, particularly on issues of racial equity. Sometimes it's not gonna be the message, it's gonna be the messenger. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's gonna be who's saying this. Um, and exactly. there's going to be cases where SGA, we might have the right smart growth tool, tactic, strategy, approach, methodology, and implementation plan, but we'd be better off partnering with and working with a different messenger who can make sure that the, the answers are heard and frankly, too, have a better ear to understand where things need to be tweaked. So we know that we're part of a broader ecosystem and we know that we're not always the right messenger, but we know that we're also a good part of the content of the message. And yeah. what we're looking for is more partnership on issues of racial equity in particular, because we can't, we know for a fact we're not always the right answer. We know for a fact that there will be moments when a history is attributed to us and some of the tools that we've used that make it harder for us to be heard. 
So we want to we want to be part of a movement that's broadening, that has more people at the table, that we can partner our expertise, whether it's we have expertise at the federal level, so let's go partner at the local level. So, you know, a friend of both of ours, we partnered with Nathaniel Smith in partnership for Southern Equity. Shout out to those guys if they're on the phone. I think they they probably are um, in Atlanta to work on the six poorest zip codes in Atlanta, which unfortunately all are predominantly African American um, lived zip codes to work on the intersection of climate change, health, and racial equity. And we did that because one, we know that sometimes we're not the right messenger. Two, there's experiences that we don't have, subject matter expertise that we don't have. But as a movement, we need these federal, state, local partnerships so that there's no missing middle. There's no missing coalition at the state level. There's no missing coalition where you have local folks. I, I did a speech the other day where I was like, Part of the problem is we're funding and we're work local folks on the ground sometimes really need to be fighting upstream because if you allow, as an example, federal rules fund transportation options. And right now that federal funding formula is disproportionately, disproportionately funds highways. The cost of a highway will get paid from 70 to 80% of the cost of the highway. But if you were proposing transit, it will only it will only pay for like 20%. And that's a relic of a of a day past that 80-20 split. So one of the things we're fighting for is to change that split and have parity. So it's 50-50. So if you're proposing public transit, mobility, infrastructure, and the like, which are the things that tend to have positive racial equity outcomes, you could be fighting on the ground in a locality and doing all the great things. But the rules came from the federal funding, the congressional legislation, and you can't fight. It's too late to fight that once it's passed. Right. So we want to have those partnerships to make sure we can work together. You know, and we, that's how we fight at the federal level. We're putting it, we've been fighting on, we call it the Rehab Act, and it's been included in a couple of places where we basically say, we need to fund what we think is important, which means we need to allow for different ways to incentivize transit-oriented development while at the same time bringing more housing to bear in that transit-oriented development, particularly more attainable and affordable housing. Right. So legislation right now will sometimes push for that, but it won't pay for the infrastructure around it. So then it doesn't happen. You don't get the placemaking. You get these sort of one-off buildings with not a lot of affordable housing. And then everyone's like, I can't believe folks got displaced. I can't believe all these bad outcomes. And it wasn't racial equity. It's like, because the federal legislation and the funding and the financing tools never allowed for it. So that's another example, systems level change partnered with local groups. That's the movement we're building, we're a part of, and that's how we're gonna get to racial equity. No, I, I think we sh should be encouraging people to submit questions. I, I, I think that's right. right. But um, please, if you have questions you want to throw at us, please do so. But I'm going to um, emphasize this point because I think one of our first meetings together, we were talking about uh, TOD and, um, and how you it's imperative. If you're going to have transit-oriented development, you 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 almost have to have a housing policy or a housing plan affiliated with it because we've seen too many times that the promise of TOD um, fall by the wayside because people ultimately were displaced by it. Um, and so right. for me, it's yeah. this is how you make connection. Just to re-emphasize the point, you make the connection by expanding the tent by inviting more people in so that you recognize the needs, so that you can recognize the blind spots. And this is what I think ultimately we're, what we are both selling to all of you is that um, we want to expand the tent. We want racial equity to be one of those pillars of, of how we define smart growth because that's the Achilles heel. That's what's missing. That's the, what- And this is, I was just talking to, um, one of our staffers, one of the team the other day. And one of the challenges with this is if you, you have to have metrics for racial equity if you right. actually intend to get the racially equitable outcomes. 
And sometimes those metrics will differ than what is the typical metric on, way, on the way you think something is good or not good. A real example of that would be if you think about transit and you say, well, one of the ways we currently analyze public transit is if we think about how fast can people get to and fro and what is the level of service? And then frankly, is it cost effective? So if you have a bus, so you know Detroit, if you live in an outskirts neighborhood in Detroit, and there's a number of cities like this because of sprawl, you can't have a quote, cost effective level of service for the 20 people that live in a neighborhood that are 10 miles away. And so you would say, no, well, we can't run that line. We can't do that bus service. We can't put that light rail in that streetcar because from a transportation analysis, you know, the typical ways you would analyze this, you say it's not cost effective. We can't do it. People are gonna be mad that we spent hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars and this bus goes by or like the DC circulator and there's only two people on it. So that's a bad answer. But if you make your metric access to jobs, access to services, the ability to get, if you're a public transit worker, if you're one of our service workers, if you're one of our essential workers, which often are predominantly people of color, getting back to racial equity, you might say, well, my metric isn't whether there's enough people to fill up the fare box to make the, the business model work. If racial equity is my metric and my main outcome, there are gonna be cases where this is not gonna be cost effective because what we're trying to do is benefit those have suffered from disinvestment who live that far away from where jobs are, not because of their design, but by the design of a system that had focused on race and racism. And so now we might need to say, we have a metric that's about access. It's not about cost effectiveness alone. And it's those type of tweaks when you change the metric that you can get the racial equity. If we just do the typical ways we analyze things and the typical formulas, we're gonna always say, you know, that'd be great to do, but that's not how we analyze these things. And that's not, that's not why we're gonna put retail there because there's just not enough customers. Um, we can't put that type of business on the ground floor of that building because it's not gonna be able to afford the rent. So maybe we need to change some of those metrics if we're gonna get the racially equitable outcome. Well, you then said a word there because let me tell you, um, too often we work within a framework of, of a false framework of scarcity. We assume that if we build something for someone, you're going to take away resources from another. And we have yeah. yet to really experience what growth really looks like when there's inclusion. Too often, like we keep thinking, oh, we're going to. Um, slice up too much of the pie, but the pie mm -hmm. will grow yep. if yep. our metrics are centered around inclusion and opportunity, not around scarcity. And so for me, when I think of smart growth, um, and go this is going back to the beginning of the conversation, it was um, at least how I was introduced to it, it was sort of to stop the sprawl because it was just becoming inefficient. It was becoming um, polluting the air, you were destroying land, all these different things. And we had to come back uh, to a more sustainable model for or, of growth. And so for me, that sustainable model has to involve increased opportunity for those who aren't involved. That's what's going to expand um, our notion of smart growth. That's what's going to expand the economy. That's what's going to and some of the waste that we see when we don't include people. And so for me, it's like, that's, I mean, you yep. said a word there. We, our metrics are really built to um, look at scarcity, which punishes people who are not already involved. Yep, yep. And you know, the other thing you can say there too is, you can be a little more Machiavellian about it. So this is supposed to be an honest fireside chat, so we should have the chat. You could say, you know, I don't really care about any of that stuff. But you could say to yourself as a city official that economic inclusion is actually good fiscal policy for yeah. this. Because if you're, if you're a city that's 50% Black or whatever percentage Black, 
and black homes are being devalued. Well, that's reducing your property tax base. That's right. That's bad fiscal policy. Um, that's right. So you could be more Machiavellian and say, well, there's an existential threat to this planet called climate change and say, well, I don't really care about a lot of those things, but disproportionate use of public transit comes from black and brown folks. Mm -hmm. So if you better the level of service, there's folks that are, you know, as I used to say growing up, are driving a hoopty, driving a beater, depending on where you live, mm -hmm. because they can't get on public transit. And that's disproportionately, in many cases, low wealth people, folks of lower income and means, and black and brown people. So it'd be better climate change policy to say, how do we make sure that our mobility, our transportation, our systems fight for access to jobs, services, public health, education, and the like, maybe because I don't really care about those other social policy things, but it's actually bad fiscal policy. And as long as we have some percentage of the population of our city whose homes are devalued, so their property taxes are lower, their actual net wealth, the actual wealth of those households, African-American households and the like are lower. So their you know, disposable income and the like is lower. So they're not, we're not getting the sales taxes that we could as a city. As long as we build to sprawl where our retail is not in the core cities, where we don't have what I recall, and many are talking about 15 minute neighborhoods where you can walk and get to a small business, maybe owned by a black and brown person, but maybe not. You can get to some of the services and resources you need within a 15 minute walk, bike or roll or some other version of mobility. If you do those things, they will have positive racial equitable outcomes. But if you don't care about that, you can just say, I'm doing it because it's great fiscal policy. That, absolutely. And, and, and that's what we have to work on. We need to work on people, the head case for some, the money case for others. And then the heart case, there's still folks who actually have a soul, who, who actually want to do the right thing regardless. But you're right, we need strategies that will talk to people's pocketbook, their head and their heart um, simultaneously. And then we'll start to see the goodness of being inclusive or, or in, in having inclusion a part of smartness in smart growth models. Oh, and this made me remember one thing on that, which gets to inclusion too, which is one of our key tactics is you got to be able to describe to a policymaker, decision maker, or someone else why something that has gotten a city-fied um, brand to it like smart growth sometimes, yeah. where people call themselves, and I'll, I'll say here for the record, um, I am not an urbanist because what I'm trying to accomplish is not to make everything urban or urbanized per se. What I'm trying to accomplish is what are the tactics and, and, and strategies that can get to healthier people, more prosperous places, and places that are more resilient against climate change. And I need to be able to have that conversation not just in Washington, D.C., but I need to be able to go to Atmore, Alabama and have that same conversation. I need to be able to go to Sparta, Georgia. I need to go to Orinda in California. I need to be able to go to smaller, rural, small towns and have yep. the same conversation and have them understand why transit and infrastructure and some of these things, broadband, are the ways not to make them more urban, not to cityfy them. We're not trying to make you into cities. But what we're trying to do is to connect you into the economic engines that that this country and then frankly this world run on. And a lot of those tactics are smart growth and they're good fiscal policy. And so it's hard. Rural America is going to have a challenge staying rural or being successful and being plugged in, not because it's not urbanizing or becoming more like cities, but because it's not plugged in metaphorically and physically to economic engines. And a lot of those are smart growth tactics that we need to be able to have that conversation. And again, build a table that includes folks from smaller places, smaller towns, and not just the urbanists who are really, you know, oftentimes are thought to be trying to cityfy up places. And it's like, our goal isn't to make you like a city. Our goal is to have you have a 
fiscally responsible approach that gets you to healthier outcomes for your people and a built environment that supports those people and supports those businesses that are there. Now, I think it's our time. Is, is, is it our time? I th- yeah, it's looking around that time where, and I'm not sure how the questions work in terms of, I think Michael may may read them through, organize them and ask them. So Yes. When, Yes, and thank you both for a, a very good conversation already. We have been getting many, many questions. Uh, so we'll uh, ask them to you for the next half an hour or so. And thanks for uh, uh, pausing to take the questions because I think the audience would be very interested in hearing your responses. So I'll just Oh, and start. by the way, just in case, just in case I'm going to be the only one getting dragged on Twitter. Andre, can you say your, your at your um, Twitter handle just so if they don't drag me, they can drag <laughs> you along with me? I'm Andre at Andre Perry EDU. And I am, I, as long as I work at the Metropolitan Policy Program, I'll be an urbanist. That's okay for me. <laughs> I'll let you but, have it. I'll let you tell no, but, but these, But I like the point because we are trapped in, often these labels trap us and limit us into what we're actually doing. I mean, yep. so um, I love the point. You know, I love the point. Great, thank you. And uh, for those who've asked about uh, slides, obviously there is no presentation today, but we will be posting the recording of the conversation, which you'll be able to watch again later if you would like. So I'll just start with the first question then. Uh, it's from uh, Jason Hercules, who says, thank you for this great conversation. Uh, regarding placemaking, is it inherent that the designs we often advocate for with smart growth and sustainability, et cetera, such as mixed use and TOD are not things that black and brown people enjoy? Or is part of the issue that the spaces are enforced in a way that makes us feel uncomfortable? And if so, should we continue to advocate for these kind of spaces? Well, I, you know, for in my, um, my opinion, many black folk want transit-oriented development. They want <laughs> uh, many of these things. It's just that if you if you don't do these things comprehensively, you can actually make matters worse for black communities. And and some of this is also about um, um, actually inviting people to participate in the planning process. When you're undergoing any kind of major development uh, project, if you're not connected to the communities, you're going to build an antip- antipathy that you know is just going to um, derail the project or, and, and create animosity um, uh, from the community. And so for me, it's about involving people in the process and even starting projects based on community need from the, from the onset. And that's important, not just, just in case folks think we're only talking about black folks. If you go to Latin, Latinx communities, yeah. Um, or Asian American communities or other, maybe even indigenous communities. There are cases where they might live in a multi-generational fashion. And so they, you might see folks who are pushing against TOD because they're worried about displacement. But in some cases, they're worried about there aren't family-sized units being built in these TOD. Right. So part of the challenge is the process didn't include them to ask what they needed. That's and right. two, oftentimes the results are not a result that they can utilize. They can't benefit from because they might have a larger family. Now, that's not a, just a function of the developer, by the way. You know, it's a function of who's financing it. It's a function of the city. Will they put their money where their mouth is? It's a function of, you know, the transportation agency and how hard it is to work in that environment. It's the zoning. Does the zoning allow for TOD that, can have some three bedroom units as an example. It's hard to finance, it's hard to do, but you have to think about these things up front and have the type of public private partnerships that are looking to get to those answers. Um, so it's not just black folks, it's, it's many black and brown um, community members who have different needs. And so I think we can build, if you wanna call it smarter growth places, but what we need to do, as Andre said, we need to change the process sometimes to have different input and more input. And then some of the outcomes also need to change so that some of the smart growth place placemaking clearly is designed to benefit the people who were there first. 
And I'll just add one more thing that many of these projects are incredible um, uh, employment opportunities for communities. And so, it, you know, particularly any kind of construction project, th these are the kinds of projects where you can put hammer in hand and get underemployed people to work. So we, so when we're talking about um, inclusion, it's from start to finish. It's from planning to the construction to the usage. All of it is necessary. And and if you, we, and when we do those things, guess what? The community embraces it because of all. I mean, let's be clear. Um, low income communities need efficiency. <laughs> they need smart growth tools. This, these are the things that. Um, uh, those kind of communities need in order to to do well. But if they're not done comprehensively, if they're not done with inclusion in mind, they will essentially exacerbate many of the inequalities that currently exist. Okay, thank you. So next question here is uh, to Calvin and Andre. How do you think of geographic equity as part of smart growth? That is health and economic inequality is even more stark between urban and rural places. What system level changes could we work on together that would eradicate structural urbanism that disqualifies or underprivileges less populated areas from getting basic needs met through infrastructure, healthcare, and so on? You know, I, you know, the Amazon competition taught me a lot about what cities were willing to do. They were essentially no pun intended, they're willing to sell the farm to get Amazon. Um, but cities should play their own gambit and states. We need, we can't have five superstar cities getting all the goods. I mean, there is an equity issue when it comes to citing industry. And we need to really think about um, making sure that there is some equity in distributing these major job centers. Now, it's harder to um, control private industry, but certainly when you're talking about government level services, we got to make sure that we distribute these goods and services um, across the spectrum in rural, um, urban places, um, the, the inner and outer rings, that we need more equity when we're talking about placement for these centers because right now you're starting to see a crowding of it's only going to the same seven mega regions in the country um i'll right. say three things to the geographic equity question um and i'll, I'll list them really quickly broadband mm. more innovation in rural mobility and main street downtown revitalization in rural and smaller towns. So, and I'll start with the last one. If you go to Irwin, Tennessee, um, shout out to John Robert Smith on our, our, our team, you'll find a very cute downtown. And if you think about the history of smaller towns, they were the walkable urban mixed use places that we're now building on purpose and, and our zoning forces scarcity and therefore makes it more expensive to rent and more expensive to buy and more expensive to run a business there. That was the country that we started in. It's sort of back to the future. And so part of what we need to do is make sure that we are funding, supporting, and, and spreading best practices to make sure that in our rural and less urban areas, we can do that small scale downtown Main Street revitalization that is necessary to create kind of microeconomic engines and get those same positive benefits. Um, the second I'll say is broadband. And that's a way to say, even if you live far away from one of these big economic clusters, you can plug in and have your business, have your educational opportunities, have your access to jobs still happen. And in many places, and we see this now being a topic of national conversation, there was a city or a smaller place where they gave out laptops to all the kids because they were gonna work virtually, but most of them didn't have the internet capacity, the bandwidth mm -hmm. to actually do distance learning. So that's an educational example, but whether it's small businesses, the ability to access services you need, and this is gonna be some of these examples of where the pandemic caused innovation that will we will keep going like telehealth. I mean, 
you can go to parts, and I learned this from some of my colleagues, you can go to some states and the nearest hospital with an ICU is 20 miles away. And so now through the pandemic, we've learned, you know, telehealth actually might be a thing. I was actually on, I did a telehealth call with my doctor just a week ago, never did it before, never even thought it was an option. And he's like 84. So it's not like an age he couldn't figure it out. It was like, we're going to do this telehealth. And now I think we're going to keep doing that. And folks are finding that. It's, so we need that broadband to make sure that our rural areas have the connectivity to opportunity, whether it's economic, educational, and otherwise. And then third, transportation innovations and mobility options for these areas. And I think one of them that's important is passenger rail, which you don't hear a lot about. But in many of these places, passenger rail is the way that folk get around and commute and would commute more if they could. So what are those different mobility options and innovations? On-demand service is another where you have buses, where basically through an algorithm and apps, people can ask, hey, I know I'm 20 miles away, but now five of us have asked for service. Now this bus can go out there. It's funded by nonprofits, philanthropy and the like. So broadband, mobility, um, and downtown revitalization, I would say, is three initial ways to fight that urban um, rural divide. And, and I'm just quickly, in my new book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black City, I do I have a section on Buy Back the Block, um, where we talk about that specific issue, um, because it's clear that there are, will always be a need for neighborhood um, facing services and, and um, retail in every community. Um, but what what about the we're in the the age of Amazon? What does that look like? And so we also need high growth industries um, to incubate high growth industries specifically in certain areas in the United States that aren't getting the love. And so, but um, we really do need to look at commercial corridors, main streets, uh, in rural areas, in, in urban areas, because those can be anchors for neighborhood development and growth overall. Great, thank you. Uh, next question here is from Richard Shepard, who says, I wanna thank the speakers for their expertise and time today. Is there a concern that the reason why we are not seeing a closer alignment between racial equity and smart growth is the perception that all growth is associated with late stage capitalism that we're seeing across the US and that any improvement made, more sidewalks, BRT, et cetera, accrues to the class of landlords and landowners, which we know are mostly white. How do we wrestle with the, we can't improve this neighborhood because it might displace these folks question? I'll, I'll say one quick thing is we have to wrestle with it by naming that history. Mm -hmm. Let's stop acting like, again, this is supposed to be a fireside chat, so I'll be a little more casual. Let's stop acting like folks haven't had this happen to them. How could they think this would be a bad thing? Why would they fight against this? The history in a hundred different books shows why someone today might think this is not going to benefit me. It's designed for someone else. And I can remember insert history in their neighborhood when this happened before. So we got to start with just acknowledging that there has been some history of this actually happening. That's right. But then we have to fight and say, but we are here today to make sure that that past isn't replicated. It's not a bad function of the tool. It's a bad function of the intent of the use of the tool. And then have that conversation. And again, sometimes it's a change in messenger. Sometimes it's a change in message and go to them and say, let me understand your concerns. Let me talk about what our intentions are and let me show you how we intend to implement in a way that will be more beneficial to the folks that have often been left out. And I think if we do that, it's a starting point. I mean, sometimes the perception becomes reality, but I think when you start coming in humble and say, you know, mistakes have been made. Yes. Or you come in and you also point to the system and say, sometimes it's the system that's the problem, 
we are coming in and actually advocating for the right things. But as long as you're zoning, as long as you're funding, as long as the next big stimulus doesn't fund and support these things that we know would benefit you, we might get the blame for it, but actually it's the system is not allowing this to happen. We all talk about wanting more affordable housing, but the system is really not defined, designed to churn out the supply that we need to bring prices, whether they're rents or our home prices down. The system will never allow for it. So if we don't change the system, we can have all the conversations we want about tax credits, opportunity zones, and the like. We got to change the system. So I think it's possible, but I think we come in humble, we acknowledge the history, and then we talk about our intentions to do different. And, you know, and we definitely have to include in our smart growth model a um, an effort to increase ownership, particularly business ownership and home ownership. No one's complaining about um growth when you own things in in the community <laughs> no one complains and so part of this is to increase home ownership increase business ownership um, making sure that the firms that take on these projects are diverse and when that occurs no one's no one's complaining about displacement because people are benefiting from the change it's when you don't own and when you're not participating that's when you are pushed out. That's when gentrification happens. So um, there has to be an effort on inclusion in terms of ownership and participation throughout the process. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question is from Kate McCarthy, who says, uh, using smart growth tactics to advance racial equity and economic inclusion makes sense to me. I think having one issue that people care about as an entry point for achieving multiple benefits is a strength of the smart growth approach. In theory, this approach should be advancing equity and inclusion today, but it's not. So what additional steps do you think we should take when we're focusing on, say, climate change or fiscal responsibility to make sure those co-benefits for racial equity and economic inclusion are actually realized? You know, and I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. that when, when you understand that we're actually trying to sustain people <laughs> and there's been um damage of the past calvin just said this in the last segment we've got to admit that many of our models have hurt uh, underrepresented groups and if we're truly looking for sus uh, sustainable models we should chiefly look at sustaining people and so th that's what's th that's an element that's missing and that's what we said earlier about making sure that when we're bringing in this sort of um, pillar of racial equity, we, we really believe that that's going to focus on structural change, that's going to focus on uh, making sure that we're connecting to the neighborhoods and, and people that are impacted by our work. And so for me, we, we've lost sight of the fact that people are the, at the center of what we do and we've forgotten that sordid history of us destroying yeah. black and brown communities in our efforts. And the other thing I'll say um, on that is we have to actually measure what we care about. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, one example that relates to this link between racial equity and climate change is, and actually COVID. So, COVID. We see disproportionate effects on African Americans, a lot of comorbidities that are a part of that. And some of those relate to respiratory diseases, asthma, and others that are not from DNA, they're not hereditary. It's because of the built environment and the system we've built. And frankly, a lot of it is auto emissions that sit on top of black and brown communities, going back to those transportation infrastructure decisions where the highways were built through neighborhoods or neighborhoods and folks were forced to situate near them. So until we have the federal government, both in its funding and its funding to states and its, its management or you know, oversight of states, for states to measure their greenhouse gas emissions, which would then force those states to do things to change that, those greenhouse gas emissions go down, though that will almost certainly mean less emissions and less congestion 
Um, and as an example, we just put out a report called Driving Down Emissions, um, which you can find on our website. What we talked about is not just the emissions, it's the particulate matter that comes from the tires and the brakes and stopping and braking and the congestion where we've built by design because we've designed without enough public transit options and mobility options. All of those things contribute to climate change, but they also contribute to these bad public health outcomes. So until we say, let's measure greenhouse gas emissions, but let's also measure when we make an infrastructure decision, who benefits, but let's also me measure, are there any detriments? So for example, we'll measure a highway and say, now Andre is able to get from his wealthy suburban enclave faster to this job. But we don't measure that, that, that essential worker who's Latinx, who lives in that neighborhood now, now it takes them 30 more minutes to get right across the street to the hospital because they have to get on the highway or go around the highway. So we have to measure what we care about. And that will be another way to get to those multi-solving benefits. But if we're not measuring it, it speaks to a lack of intentionality to get to the outcome. And, but what's critical in what you stated, you got to measure the right things because um, I'll give you an example. When I used to do a lot of work in education, one of the questions I used to get all the time was, how do you close the black-white achievement gap? What's the fastest way to close the black-white achievement gap? And I used to joke, like, well, the fastest way to close the black-white achievement gap is to stop educating white people. That'll close the gap real quick. But we would never do that for good reasons. But look what we have done in the past. We fired a bunch of black teachers to supposedly to close the uh, black-white achievement gap. We suspended and expelled a bunch of black students. The question has never been, can we close the gap? It's how we close the gap. So for me, it's about measuring the right things. And if we don't, we can easily make the mistake of encouraging something the wrong way and so you're absolutely right it's not about just measuring an effect but how are we doing it and who is it impacting in the in the process yep. thank you thanks Andre. next question is uh do you think that it's possible to include local community organizations and ngos in the provision of their housing including sec sweat equity within a framework of public-private community partnership or other forms of partnership? And if yes, could you ex briefly explain how? Um, I know Habitat for Humanity has that very model where sweat equity is the way to home ownership um, and they've been able to scale it worldwide. So I think that's a real example. And I think there's some new innovative models that really get to cooperatives um, as well as um, there's an organization called the Grounded Solutions Network, where you look at um, housing trusts and you, you basically create a way where folks can own and the affordability of the housing is in the trust so that it can be affordable for, you know, essentially for infinity. So there's a couple of models. Um, and Andre may know of some more, but part of the, the, the real question is, what is the goal? And the goal is to say, if you have wealth disparities, how do you get people into homes if they don't have one of the core things that we usually request, which is a down payment? And I also think that's where we should think more radically and more in a more innovative way and say, well, what if we said we, one of our goals is to create 300,000 more Latinx homeowners in this country by 2025. And we said, well, we're going to achieve that goal by giving X amount of Latinx folks of a certain educational attainment alike, we're going to give them $75,000 each cash money as a down payment on a home. So we need to think outside of the box and say, well, if the goal is home ownership and the disparity has already been there, and when we did the Homestead Act and the GI Bill 
in other ways where we def we specifically, and Andre was saying this earlier, we specifically subsidized white people through through purposeful investment and exclusion of Black and Latinx and Asian Americans and other people, indigenous. So maybe now we need to be more innovative and say, well, some of these goals, it's like there's a couple of pieces of the puzzle that maybe we just need to solve that problem and say, we give them the cash, we, we help figure out what kind of financial institutions can get around credit scores and those type of things that are also barriers. We change the zoning and that those type of, and it'll be a multiple models. So it won't just be Habitat for Humanity or uh, Habitat for Humanity or trusts or cooperatives or this sort of cash structure. We'll use all of them and see which work and see which are replicable and scalable. Well, you know, and you hit the nail on the head that the days of the only a single way to purchase a home or um, the ownership in sort of a single family home model, um, we need more models. And and we also need models that aren't necessarily wedded to wealth building. Some people need homes just to be anchored in community. You know? The ability that if you look at the impacts of the pandemic right now, I was just reading that they talked about instability and compare just homeowners to renters. Oh. And that alone, the domino effects of the pandemic affecting landlords, which then affects tenants, the more you own, and this also applies to commercial businesses, the more you own, that stability alone, even if it doesn't build your wealth, which it almost certainly will, but let's say we took that off the table and yeah. just said, what about the public health benefits of not having to move? If anybody hasn't read Evicted by Matthew Desmond, read that book. Read because it. it talks about the domino effects on health and all the criteria you want to think about for people just on instability of your home. So if we could create something that isn't even related to wealth building, but create that stability, there'll be all these other effects that will then lead you to wealth building anyway, even if that wasn't the main point. And I'm, I'm just going to reemphasize the plug I said earlier. Um, we we have this competition with Ashoka that we're going to announce. So it'll get, provide folks out there an opportunity to submit their um, strategies and approaches to create home, um, home ownership to reduce devaluation. And but this is an area we need. This is where the smart growth community can contribute mightily to the national conversation. We need yep. new models. And we're going to have um, in January, speaking of plugs, but January 26th to 28th, and Andre will be there because he's my man, 50 grand. We're going to continue this conversation on racial equity and smart growth. And we're going to do a national, if not international, virtual summit that drills down with multiple panels and great speakers like Andre and others who have analyzed these things in different ways. And really want all of you to join that conversation in January. There'll be a save the date that we'll blast out in many ways. And hopefully um, University of Maryland and Smart Growth Network will be a part of helping us work on that. But we're gonna continue this conversation about racial equity because neither Andre and I, we don't have all the answers either. Half of these answers, these new models come from you guys, come from you thinking outside of the box, come from folks, as Andre was saying, like like me and, and, and actually like Andre, who don't come from a planning discipline who don't come from the usual disciplines that feed into smart growth, it might have a whole different way of thinking about how to get to smart growth outcomes. So we need all of you to help us think through these things, learn us up, train us up, educate us. And we're gonna convene in January from 26th to the 28th virtually um, to do that. So look for um, our equity smart growth summit um, coming to you in January. So. It'll be a it'll be a great time. It'll be conversations like this with with even smarter, better looking people. <laughs> you can't be better looking. Maybe smarter. Uh, can't be better looking. I'll let you know. It might be our time. Yeah. Well, well, let me ask you one last question. And I appreciate yep. all of this. We won't be able to get to nearly all of the questions. In fact, only a few. But uh, on that last point, Calvin, let me ask this one. Uh, what advice can you both give to an up-and-coming planner who wants to ingrain racial equity into her work from the very beginning? How can job seekers know if a workplace 
really lives by these principles? Well, I, I think of, of all the time that this might be very simplistic. Um, you're in a moment where joining an organization that is focused on racial equity is critical. Um, and it might be a traditional civil rights organization. It might be a new organization, but we need your tools um, in these organizations, and you need the organizations to teach you the needs around racial equity. So um, I think this is the time for joining, becoming a member of an organization that's not the typical planning organization, but you'd be surprised how much planning um, is going on within these organizations and how much your tools can contribute to the overall growth of that organization and society. The other thing I'll say on that is, what is the CEO talking about? Every CEO of every organization, particularly nonprofits that you mm -hmm. are looking at, you can Google and find a speech. You can find a dozen speeches. If you Google me, you're gonna find me talking about racial equity, yeah. not just smart growth. When you see the job description, does it mention equity? Does it mention uh, a focus on that or needing that as a tool in the toolkit? Does the website talk about equity? Do their blogs, on and on and on. When you go through their social media handle, is does the issue come up? Um, usually, if none of those things are true, then it's less likely that that is a focus of the organization. Look at their mission statement. What's their North Star? Um, so I would say oftentimes folks show themselves as to what they find important and what their priorities are. And if you don't see anything about that, um, the last thing I would say is, um, and this sort of relates to Andre's point as well, is be courageous. Mm. So you, as a friend once told me, and I never forget it, you are the prize. So when you're interviewing, ask them about their focus and incorporation of uh, racial equity, equitable outcomes, equitable processes and the like in their work. See what their answer is. See what their body language looks like when you ask them the question. Look around the virtual room or the office and see who's sitting there, who's on the board. And so be courageous enough to say, if this is really something I wanna incorporate from the beginning, then I need to maybe do the extra work and homework and maybe turn down a job at a place that doesn't talk about these things or speak to an intentionality of getting there. Great, thank you. So uh, we will wrap up here. Just wanted to leave the floor for both of you to leave us with any final thoughts today. Well, I, I wanna say? first thank um, Calvin for ex extending the invitation. I always just have a good time talking with Calvin. I learn a lot. Um, and it's very easy um, to talk about these issues. And, and that's my goal. I wanna make these issues easy to talk about. For too long, when we talk about racial equity, it's, there's been a lot of tension in, in the room. And, and it doesn't have to be. This is about sustainability. This is about growth. This is about being smart. And it makes sense that racial equity should be a centerpiece, a pillar in smart growth. And, and so um, I'm looking forward to additional conversation. Calvin mentioned there will be a convening in January. I will be there. And so, but the goal is to make these conversations easy because the work is hard. And we're going to have to roll up our sleeves. We're going to have to dig deep and we're going to have to create um, incredible solutions to these complicated problems. Um, but we really do need to, to work together and, and to, to share in an experience of growth. So um, thank you, Calvin, and, and thanks for everyone for, for staying with us for 90 minutes. Um, I'm not gonna say much, but thank you, Andre. I share the sentiment um, as well. And, you know, otherwise join us, everybody. You know, sign up, subscribe to, uh, you know, our newsletter, you can go on the website, follow Andre and I, follow Smart Growth America, follow, my transfer T4 America, our Complete Streets team, our Locust developers, we're all on Twitter. Um, follow us, join this conversation, push us, ask us the tough questions um, and make us better. Come to our convenings. We all see, we need everybody at this table. We're, 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 we have 
we know that you will make us better. Um, and we want to have that conversation. And then I want to say one last thing, which is go vote. Great. Well, thank you both today for being with us. This will conclude our webinar, What Does Equity and Smart Growth Really Mean? A conversation between Calvin Gladney and Andre Perry. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Calvin and Andre for a great discussion, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru who helps to make all this happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Keep an eye out on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars. For those of you who've registered uh, from our last blast, you'll see that we have our last uh, Maryland Walktober walk in our next Thursday. We hope to see you there. Have a great day.